Mr. Tim, how are you doing, sir? How are you? How are you? I think when I'm on a roll, I mean, I'm not in that space all the time, but I think when when I can get into that, I can re then I really, like, I, I, I feel like, you know, it's like that runner's high when you're out there and you're doing your exercise and all of a sudden the endorphins kick in and you have that, that period. It's not, it doesn't last forever, but where you, you can really roll with it and um, I, that happens for me when I'm, when I'm doing the typing. It helps that I read it aloud, although it's like at a mumble. Um, I think it, it adds a, a, a little bit of a sonic element to the to the performance, but it also very much helps me stay Focus. focused on where I am on the on the on the line and where I am in the story. Mm -hmm. Earlier, you told me about how you came with the concept. Could you repeat that when you were telling me about that you you always been involved with writing? Sure, sure. So, you know, I arrived at at this typewriter project, I guess is what I'm calling it, uh, I think as a result of years of, of artwork in and around literature and text, you know, that's how, that, that was the source for my, my visual art was, you know, co-opting quotes or building sculptures around Henry Miller or even um, to, to accompany those Henry Miller sculptures, I had this particular quote from, from Tropic of Capricorn, which was this, this long litany of cunts. And it, and it talked about, and in the craziest terms, and so that exhibit had the sculptures with the quote on it, but also um, renderings of, and they were like nine, some of them were nine or ten feet tall, of these giant hairy exploding vaginas. And so I was working in all this stuff, and, um, and, and then I came out of that, and I wanted a counterbalance to that, and I, I picked up Anis Nin's uh, collection of erotica, The Delta of Venus, which is 15 stories of varying length. Um, all erotic on some level and I bought the mass market paperback books and I pulled them apart and I painted out the pages or at least partially obscured the text and then retook typed every word of the text back on each of those pages and then I mounted that up on these scrolls of wallpaper some of the stories were pretty short so they're just a couple feet long the longest story Elena is 33 feet long as I've mounted it um, and it, it works as a diptych also because if you if you take the first page and you mount that you lose the page underneath so you have to flip it you have to basically buy two books to create one work and I wanted to kind of represent that a little bit and create two scrolls that worked side by side or one on top of the other with a positive and a negative and and in doing that I think I really got captivated by the formal quality of the page and which is to say that a page is a rectangle, and then within that is a smaller rectangle of text. And I thought about playing with that and pushing that a little bit further, and I think that that's, you know, really where the idea of retyping an entire novel on one page to accentuate that formal quality, I think that's really where that came from. Excellent. Um, tell me how you, uh, uh, how Andy got in contact with you. So the gallery that represents me, Coagula Curatorial, and the gallerist, Matt Gleason, uh, knows Andy. And I mean, I certainly knew who she was, and I, I met her maybe a couple years ago, just a hello. Um, I mean, she has a great stature in the LA um, and Southern California arts community. And then when I started to develop this and working with the gallerist, who's been integral to, to you know my development of this, he said, hey, let's see what we can do up in, in Lancaster. You know, they've got the new museum up there. And, and he asked me, well, what could I do up there? And I thought about it a little bit, did a little bit of, you know, research, and, and then realized, hey, 
you know, the right stuff. I mean, that's a book I read, you know, 20 years ago. Of course, that's a natural. It's right there. There's Edwards. That's Jaeger. You know, everything about the, my favorite parts of the right stuff. You know, the whole thing's a good story, but my favorite parts are certainly the story about, you know, the build up to, hey, you know, the 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 uh, the top dog of all the hot shots is Chuck Yeager, and he, you know, lives in this, you know, in this, this godforsaken desert. That's the description, yeah. right? Yeah, correct. Um, and and he's out here, and you know, this is whatever, 40, 50, 60 years ago now. Um, and those are those are definitely when he breaks the sound barrier. I mean, that's you know, you can't get any better than that, right? I mean, that's that's the great part of the story. And so I thought, yeah, that would be great to do out here. And then when Matt talked to her. And she was organizing the space exhibit. I think the synergy even became more apparent. Like, hey, this is great. You know, why not? So that's how it came together. Very good. Um, what is next? Where uh, Where are you going next? Uh, so in, uh, I'm here uh, through through August, um, certain days of the week, and then in September I go to Indianapolis to the Kurt Vonnegut Memorial Library, where I'm going to retype his novel, Breakfast of Champions. And then in October, I will be back here, I think, for probably something like the last four or five days of this, this exhibit to finish up the typing, that whatever I haven't finished. So I, I, I don't know exactly how many pages I'll have left, but I'll try to finish it um, by the closing weekend. Then in November, I'll be down in Santa Ana at Grand Central Arts, which is part of uh, Cal State Fullerton. And I'm going to type Philip K. Dick's novel, A Scanner Darkly. And oddly enough, you know, maybe not oddly, but but it's a little known fact, it seems, or a well-kept secret that Philip K. Dick spent the last 10 or 12 years of his life down in Orange County and in Santa Ana in particular. So that's going to be cool to do that. Um, the gallery's working on a few others. Um, and then in May of next year, I'll be in Paris with the Henry Miller Memorial Library typing um, Miller's Tropic of Cancer because that was his, his Paris story. So. I think I'll be pretty busy doing these. You know, I've got a long list. I've got three or four years worth of typing to do. Bring us back a little bit of the where where uh, where were you born? Where where you uh, grew up? Uh, sure. Well, I'm from Worcester, Massachusetts. I was born in Worcester, Massachusetts, which is kind of the center of, of Massachusetts, about you know 90 miles inland from Boston. Uh, I was born there, and I grew up in a small town, a few um, towns away from Worcester to the northwest, called Rutland which is actually the geographic center of the state. However that is calculated, that's Central Tree Road in Rutland, which is a half mile from where I grew up. That's where, that's where I was from. Were you, in, were, you, uh, were you thinking about being an artist? You grew up with the uh, conception that you were an artist? Well, my mom's an artist, and she still is, and she paints. And so I think it wasn't really necessarily about, hey, was I thinking about being an artist? She just had the tools in my hand from an early age and always gave me encouragement. And it was there for me. And the reality is, is that I, I, once, I, be, once I, I got to high school and then went to college and started to think about you know, making my way, um, being an artist was like the last thing on my mind. I actually went to work in an investment bank on Wall Street when I got out of college. So I, I've taken a, the long route back to, to art. You know, I certainly moved away from it in my early 20s, and it wasn't until my early 30s where I kind of re-engaged with it. Um, but that's cool. You know, you got to live your life, and you got to explore in whatever way you, you, you know you think. And um, I think that if you force art on somebody, if my mother had forced it on me. I probably wouldn't be making art today. We're, we're still working in Wall Street, yeah, making right, millions exactly. of dollars, right. and not doing, not being right. happy. Right. And the reason I ask you that is uh, the next question will be: What what is your uh, recommendation, or what would you advise to the young generations that come behind us, and they will see these videos? In terms of art, or just in terms of in, uh, living and enjoying art, and being you know, being being an artist, what is your you know, intake on that? Well, I think for me, look, I didn't go to art school, so I, I, it's hard for me to critique art school from the inside out. I, I, I ha and I have kids. I, I'm not necessarily rushing to push them in that direction. I think that, that there's a certain amount of theory and, and whatnot that can be too much is too much and it can kind of stifle you. I think that a more liberal 
arts education, which could include some art, um, but certainly a lot of reading and a lot of thinking about history and literature. To me, that worked for me. Like I, I don't want to prescribe anything for anybody necessarily, but I know that that path ultimately gave me a, a rich enough background combined with my mother's you know, Excellent. encouragement and, and just giving me the tools that when I was ready, you know, when, when, you know, that opportunity finally arose in my life and I was ready to embrace visual art and the making of visual art, I, I had something to draw on. And, and I think that that's, you know, that's what I have drawn on all this time is, is you know, borrowing into the literature and making art out of something that I really love to do, which was, was, was real. I mean, that was the thing. And is this, uh, this is your career, this is where, this is the path you've chosen, so are you going to continue? Oh yeah, uh, sure, there's no looking back now, right? <laughs> Very good. Uh, <laughs> I'm too old to look back. <laughs> where can, where can uh, people go see you art? Do you have, uh, do you have galleries representing you or your work sure. displayed? Sure, so my work is, is represented by Coagula Curatorial uh, in Chinatown in Los Angeles. Uh, the piece that I typed in the, po in the parking lot of the Terminal Annex post office, Bukowski's post office, that novel, will actually be up in the group show down there uh, starting August 10th. And I think he's going to run that for a month or something like that. So that's a place to see it. Um, of course, this, this shows up through mid-October. Um, I'm not sure on the, lat the end date, maybe the 15th or, you know. Check the check the program before you come up. But um, so I've got you know uh, six of them, six of the diptychs here, and um, hopefully, well certainly then in November, I think a few of the pieces will be down at Grand Central Arts. Have you have you typed any uh, or is in your in, in your itinerary to type any poetry, any book of poetry, any prose? Yeah. So I actually I I'm ex I want to do some poetry because I think. Um, for, the, the page is going to look different. In, in when, you're type, when I'm typing the novel, I'm not, I'm, there's not a need to respect the line the same way there is in poetry. So when I'm going to do a volume of poetry, I'm going to, if, if the poet ends you know, his line there, halfway through the page, I'm going to return on the typewriter. And so what I think will happen is, is that I'll get a much heavier indentation, blackness and indentation on the left side, and I'll have streams of varying length that will right. play out on the right side, and maybe a few more words will be visible or not, or however it kind of overlaps or not. But I th I'm, I'm excited to do it for that reason, and there's a few poets that I'd like to do. I, I've, I'd like to retype all of Ginsburg's poetry up at City Lights. We'll see what happens. I mean, I've made a request, you know, that they're, who knows, maybe it'll happen. Um, Wallace Stevens has always been my favorite poet, and so I'd like to type him back in Hartford because, as you, you may recall, he was an insurance executive his whole life. Even after he had won a Pulitzer Prize, he wouldn't let go of his, his job as an insurance um, you know, vice president, which is fascinating, right? I mean, there was something in that, working in that, that you know, what you would think was, would be such a dry and boring um, world that worked for him creatively, that allowed him to uncork that that amazing poetry, you know, at the end of the night, you know, after he left his job. So yeah, I'd know, like to do that. Back then. He he was well read. Yeah. He was well, good. surely he was that. As yeah, you mentioned, I mean, yeah, reading no is yeah. reading is super important. <laughs> yeah. So, Tim, but thank you very much for this uh, for your time. Oh, you we bet. really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, sir.